Hello friends, welcome to another session of Biochemistry on the PGIMS channel. Let us now start our discussion on RNA. Yesterday we had stopped at uh, DNA. We talked about the nuclear, the cell free and the mitochondrial DNA. And let us uh, today start with the RNA. Before I start, I wish a very happy Ramadan to all of you. And I hope all our Muslim friends had a very nice iftar party. So my best wishes to all of you on this auspicious occasion. Okay. Let us now start our Okay, just let me have a feedback whether you're getting the clear audio, clear video. I hope there is no lag. So it would be nice to hear from you whether you are getting the clear audio, clear video or not. Like I said, we will be talking tonight about the RNA. We'll be talking to tonight about the RNA. Please send in your comments whether the audio is clear or not, whether you can uh, see the video clearly or not. You need to be able to see the screen as well as me. What's happening to the lonely screen? Why is it not getting the feed? Come on, lonely screen. Where is the feed? Uh -huh. Lonely screen. Screen airpad feed is not coming. Where is the airpad feed? Let's see what's happening. It's not it coming. Anyone online? I can't see any of you online. Are you there, people? Just let me know if you are there. We are starting the session. And my airpad screen has crashed, it seems. Let's see. It doesn't hear. It should be here. And great. Maybe later. Okay. okay okay so uh, let us start let us start and uh, great so it would be nice to get the feedback about you whether you are able to hear me whether the video is clear can you see the pad iPad if it is visible uh, just let me know if there is any lag uh, any audio video uh, sync issue if it is there just let me know those things before we start the session okay okay so it looks everything is fine and uh, let's start our session about the rna as you know rna is the ribonucleic acid it is the ribonucleic acid meaning the sugar in this case is the ribose the sugar in this case is ribose now when we talk about rna we quickly subdivide them into two subgroups the rna can be coding or it can be non coding Among the coding, we have only one single RNA and that is the messenger RNA. Only one coding RNA is there and that is the messenger RNA. When I say the coding RNA, what I mean is the RNA which can get translated into the protein. If we read the sequence of the nucleotides, we can directly use it for generating the protein. So that will be the coding RNA and that is the messenger RNA. Among the non-coding RNA, we can subdivide them 
as a functional and non-functional although most of the books use a different classification which is the small and the long non-coding RNA the small and the long non-coding RNA I'll talk about the small and no long ones I have listed uh, the functional non-coding RNA the functional non-coding RNA now talking about the functional non-coding RNA we have the ribosomal RNA we have the heterogeneous nuclear RNA we have the small nuclear RNA we have the micro RNA in the plants we have the analog which is the uh, SI silencing RNA and then we have the transfer RNA these are some of the non coding but functional RNA non coding but functional RNA all other RNA would be non-functional so when we say non-coding generally we are talking about the non-functional because the functional have their own names now uh, one other thing I told you that uh, they can be labeled as the small non-coding and the long non-coding all right the small long non-coding will be in the heterogeneous nuclear RNA which obviously later gets converted to the messenger RNA later gets converted to the messenger RNA and another name in this list could be the ribosomal RNA the ribosomal RNA among the small non-coding RNA we have the SNRNA which automatically means the small uh, nuclear RNA we have the micro RNA and we have the transfer RNA okay I have a question on the screen I'll take it after I complete the RNA don't worry uh, you can send your questions in between let me finish this session on RNA and uh, then I'll take uh, this question or any other uh, question which is flashing in any question immediately relating to what we are discussing I'll take them immediately but uh, other questions I'll take them when we stop for a break or something okay so this is a secondary description which is used for the non-coding RNA the small and the long non-coding RNA among the long non-coding RNA we also have uh, some RNA which is simply known as the long non-coding RNA these are uh, transcribed from the DNA but subsequently uh, they are not processed or they don't have any translation related fate so they are simply known as the long non-coding RNA so this is another description used for the non-coding RNA although it is not a functional description what we discussed previously is the functional description talking about the coding and the non-coding and the non-coding being divided to the functional and the non-functional now in the prokaryotes uh, all the RNA is transcribed by the same RNA polymerase meaning we have a single RNA polymerase in the prokaryotes but if you talk about the eukaryotes in eukaryotes we have the different types of RNA polymerases so what I'll do I'll quickly write the different RNA polymerases in the eukaryote right and very quickly mention uh, which uh, RNA is coming from which uh, type of RNA polymerase remember we are talking about the eukaryotes in eukaryote we have the different type of RNA polymerase so in eukaryotes we have the three different types of polymerases type 1 type 2 and type 3 here I'll quickly tell you that uh, uh, in uh, prokaryotes a single RNA polymerase in eukaryotes we have one two and three RNA polymerase but when we go to DNA in the prokaryotes the DNA polymerase is of three types one two and three and the eukaryotes we have multiple types of the DNA polymerase alpha beta delta epsilon gamma like that we have a large number of DNA polymerase in the eukaryotes so don't get confused between two 
RNA polymerase 2 the snRNA is also synthesized by RNA polymerase 2 and the miRNA the micro RNA is also synthesized by the RNA polymerase 2 the transfer RNA is coated by RNA polymerase 3 along with the 5s ribosomal rna along with the 5s ribosomal rna the transfer rna is synthesized by the rna polymerase 3 so this you have to remember because uh, you may get the question talking about uh, which rna is synthesized from which rna polymerase that you should know in addition you have to remember the eukaryotic RNA polymerase are inhibited by the alpha amanitin. They are inhibited by alpha amanitin. The strongest inhibition is for RNA polymerase 2. The strongest inhibition is for alpha amanitin 2. The 1 and 3 are also inhibited, but to varying degree, and uh, the intensity is lesser than what is seen for the RNA polymerase 1 and 3. The strongest inhibition by alpha manitin is for RNA polymerase 2. As you can see, RNA polymerase 2 is the primary uh, polymerase. It is making most of the important uh, RNA. In addition, sometimes you can be asked about the messenger RNA. Remember, the messenger RNA cannot be transcribed by RNA polymerase directly the RNA polymerase will synthesize the HNRNA and like we said the HNRNA is then processed to give the messenger RNA so if at all you are uh, you have to mark one of the RNA polymerase for messenger RNA in that case the best answer would be RNA polymerase 2 if one RNA polymerase has to be marked then the best answer would be the RNA polymerase 2 because it is synthesizing the HNRNA and the HNRNA can then get converted to the messenger RNA so what we'll do, we'll take them up one by one and quickly see the points that you need to know about each of them, starting with the ribosomal RNA. So first we have the ribosomal RNA. The first one is ribosomal RNA. In eukaryotes, the ribosomal RNA is of multiple types, the 5S the 5.8s 18s and 28s so first question is what do you mean by s what is the s the s stands for swedberg constant stands for swedberg constant or the other name is the sedimentation coefficient sedimentation coefficient right so s is a swedberg not constant swedberg unit or the sedimentation coefficient swedberg unit or the sedimentation coefficient it tells us how quickly or how uh, how much time a particular particle is going to settle down when we subject it uh, to ultra centrifugation all right more the value the faster the particle will settle down the less the value more centrifugation force you require for the particle to settle down okay so like we said the 5s synthesized by the rna pol 3 and for the 5.8s 18s and 28s we said the answer is rna polymerase 1 
But what is very interesting is RNA polymerase 1 does not synthesize the 5.8S, 18S and 28S individually. What it does, it synthesizes a precursor. It synthesizes a precursor like this. This precursor which has been synthesized is actually a 45S ribosomal RNA. It is a 45S ribosomal RNA which can be split into three. Which can be split into three. 18S, 5.8S and the 28S ribosomal RNA. So once the RNA has been transcribed, it undergoes what is known as the post transcriptional modification. Please note the post transcriptional modification. So what I want to highlight here is that the ribosomal RNA undergo the post transcriptional modification for the longest time you must might be remembering that the only post transcriptional modification which is occurring is from HNRNA to messenger RNA. No, it is not true. The post transcriptional modification as you can see can also occurs in case of ribosomal RNA. The 45S ribosomal RNA is converted into the 5.8S, 18S and the 28S ribosomal RNA. In the prokaryotes, the counterpart of 18S is 16S. The counterpart of 28S is the 23S ribosomal RNA. In prokaryotes and eukaryotes, some of the subunits are different. For example, you may not find the 5.8S ribosomal RNA in the prokaryotes. Another thing to note is the 23S ribosomal RNA of prokaryotes and the 28S ribosomal RNA of the eukaryotes have a very well defined catalytic function they have a very well defined catalytic function and what is that catalytic function we previously mentioned they function as peptidyl transferase meaning they are a type of ribozyme remember we had said rna with catalytic activity is known as ribozyme the rna with catalytic activity is known as ribozyme and the 23s or 28s ribosomal rna have the catalytic activity which is the peptidyl transferase it is a peptidyl transferase we'll see this enzyme in action when we are doing the protein translation so remember the 23s ribosomal rna of prokaryotes or the 28s ribosomal rna of eukaryotes function as peptidyl transferase and therefore they are known as a ribozyme okay so this is about the ribosomal rna that you need to know about extra information not required the ribosomal rna obviously is a part of the ribosome where it is associated with a very large number of proteins together they participate in the translation the ribosomal RNA are themselves a part of the complex called ribosome where a large number of proteins are present and uh, together they participate in the post in the uh, translation. Okay, so what we have done is the ribosomal RNA. Okay, let's talk about the HNR, HNRNA. The HNRNA stands for heterogeneous nuclear RNA. This is what I mean when we say the HNRNA. This is the heterogeneous nuclear RNA. A group of RNA present inside the nucleus which have variable size. Generally what happens, a particular class of RNA will have the similar size. But this class of RNA has a large number of varying sizes and that is why we call it the heterogeneous nuclear RNA. The term heterogeneous here relates to the different sizes of the different uh, members of this family. See, this is obvious why the sizes will be different because it is a transcript from the gene. 
the different genes will have different size depending on the final product if the protein product which has to come out is small the gene will be small in size if we are let's say going to translate the apob 100 apob 100 i told you is a very big protein 545 kilo dalton is the ma mass therefore it is likely to have a very large uh, gene and therefore the hnrna coming from the gene for apob 100 is going to be very 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 large so the size will directly correlate to the protein which has to be produced and therefore they are definitely going to have varying sizes so remember heterogeneous nuclear rna will have varying sizes which depends on the size of the final product that is the protein the heterogeneous nuclear rna will also undergo what we just mentioned as the post transcriptional modification it will also undergo what you mentioned as post transcriptional modification this is the classical post transcriptional modification that we normally talk about the classical post transcriptional modification that we normally talk about three things are occurring simultaneously number one capping number two tailing and number three is what happened I hope it is coming now. So always when we are doing the transmission, we have one technical challenge or the another. It uh, never happens that we have a thoroughly smooth class. So Mm, please bear with us because some of the things are totally out of our hand uh, it got stuck i don't know why it got stuck so i had to uh, remove it and uh, re-add it as you can see uh, just keeping fingers crossed that uh, it doesn't happen again if it happens again we'll try to correct it uh, when it happens till then let's continue okay so we're talking about the post transcription modification that occurs in the heterogeneous nuclear rna first was the capping second is the tailing and the third is what is known as splicing third is what is known as the splicing so when we say capping what exactly does it mean capping means adding seven methyl guanosine where at 5 dash end add the 7 methyl guanosine at 5 dash end what about tailing in tailing we are adding poly a at 3 dash end we are adding the poly a at 3 dash end and in splicing 
two things happen first removal of introns removal of introns followed by joining of exons removal of introns followed by the joining of exons so we have the capping tailing and splicing okay we'll talk about them one by one capping i said is the addition of seven methyl guanosine very frequently we get confused whether it is a seven methyl guanosine or the five methyl guanosine remember we add it at five dash end but always it is the seven methyl guanosine always it is the seven methyl guanosine so this point you have to remember the seven methyl guanosine is added at five dash end what is the purpose of the capping and the tailing is it just to make our rna more beautiful it is going for a fancy show so it has uh, put on a cap and it has put on a dummy tail here for example you prepare get your child dressed up he is going for a costume show so you make him a rabbit you give him the rabbit costume so it has a small tail at the back is it something like that we want to dress up our rna it will look better uh, no the primary function of capping and tailing is to increase the stability the primary function is increase stability how they form closed structure and this closed structure will protect from the enzymes rnas because the rnas is the exonuclease it acts from the ends if you close the structure there will be no end see this is the cap and this is the tail the cap and the tail we said the cap and tail will have affinity for each other they have affinity for each other and therefore they form a closed structure like this they will form a closed structure like this and now when the exonucleus comes it will cleave here it will cleave here it will cleave here and now it cannot cleave because now there is no end exonucleus can cleave only from the end it cannot act anywhere in between for this we will require a different enzyme which is endonucleus which is present in much lesser amount so because of this closed structure the stability is increased and the rna will survive for a much longer time okay this is the requirement for the cap and the tail so the cap and tail will increase stability and they form closed structure this closed structure will form protect from the action of exonucleus in this case it is the rnas in addition the capping has another important function it is used for identification during translation lot of rna is there in the cytoplasm which of them is the messenger rna how to identify the messenger rna we identify the messenger rna with the help of the 7 methyl guanosine cap the rna which has the 7 methyl guanosine is the messenger rna that is the rna we are going to take for translation so it is used for identification during translation and this identification is done by the 4e subunit of eukaryotic initiation factor 4f we will see this when we are doing the translation that uh, the identification of the cap is done by the 4e subunit of eukaryotic initiation factor 4f okay one additional important question which is asked is if you translate the poly a tail which amino acid are you going to get in other words which is the amino acid coded by the codon aaa the answer 
is lysine and therefore when you translate it you get polylysine we have repeating a a a subunits so we get the polylysine when we translate the poly a subunit we are likely to get the polylysine now talking about the splicing part the removal of introns followed by joining of exons first point to notice this is not in a fixed pattern there is lot of scope for variation there is lot of scope for variation resulting in results in large number of different final products i'll give you an example a very simple straightforward example see you have this heterogeneous nuclear rna you have the exon the intervening areas are the introns okay let's say this is exon 1 this is exon 2 and this is exon 3 so first thing to notice it is not necessary to include all the exon in the final product one possible transcript would be you add exon 1 you add exon 2 and you add exon 3 this is the uh, simplest way in which we can make it second possibility can be you add exon 1 and you add only exon 3 third possibility can be you add exon 1 and you add only exon 2 fourth possibility can be you add exon 2 and you add only exon 3 so there are various ways in which the splicing can occur the pattern of splicing is not fixed in addition to that it is not necessary that every time whole of the exon will be incorporated maybe you can add only a part of the exon the part i have shaded can be left behind similarly you can have a part of the second exon okay so even a part of the exon can be used for incorporation and that is why we get a large number of different final products from the same hnrna large number of different final products from the same hnrna due to different permutations and combinations so please understand this the same hnrna can give rise to a large number of final messenger rna okay that is one uh second thing is for splicing the complex which is formed the complex which is formed is known as spliceosome the complex which is formed is known as spliceosome and which is the uh, catalyst in the spliceosome the catalyst in the spliceosome are the small nuclear rna so small nuclear rna plus plus several proteins and which is linked to the h n rna heterogeneous nuclear rna this is the structure of the spliceosome it has a small nuclear rna the several proteins and the hn rna the primary function of splicing is done by the small nuclear rna it is the splicer the splicer is the small nuclear rna the splicing is a catalytic function meaning the small nuclear rna is also a ribozyme the splicing is a catalytic function so remember the small nuclear rna is also a ribozyme the first ribozyme was the 23s oblique the 28s ribosomal rna the second ribozyme is the small nuclear rna here only i'll give you the third ribozyme third ribozyme is the intron which has the self splicing activity 
intron has self splicing activity therefore it is also recognized as a ribozyme so intron the small nuclear rna and the 28s ribosomal rna are the three well known uh, ribozyme in the eukaryotes the few points about small nuclear rna few points about the small nuclear rna the snrna is rich in uracil and therefore the symbol used for snrna is u so when i write u it means we are talking about the small nuclear rna okay so we have different types of u u1 2 4 5 and 6 they participate in splicing they participate in splicing u7 modifies u7 modifies the hn rna of histone please note i have not written the uh splicing i have not used the term splicing i have written the term modifies the hn rna of histone why i have used this peculiar term because in the histone we don't have any intron it is the only rna transcript in the eukaryotes which does not have introns it is the only uh, hn rna transcript in the eukaryotes without introns so it doesn't need splicing rather it undergoes modification for activation lastly u3 does not participate in splicing it does not participate in splicing so these are some minor details about the snrna it is rich in uracil therefore the symbol used is u and the various types are u1 2 3 4 5 6 7 u1 2 4 5 and 6 participate in splicing u7 participates in modification of the hnrna of histone u3 is not having many well known action in the splicing so this is uh, the detail about the snrna let's go to the top okay so we have talked about the hnrna and we have talked a little bit about the snrna remember the hnrna by post transcriptional modification gets converted into the messenger rna now let us first talk about the transfer rna and then i'll talk about the micro rna okay so now we are talking about the transfer rna one of the most commonly asked rna in the exam is the transfer rna one of the most commonly asked rna in the exam the transfer rna the transfer rna is commonly known as the adapter molecule all of you use adapter a charger a phone charger is an adapter what it does it converts the 220 volt of electricity in the socket to maybe 1 or 1.5 or up to 3 volt of electricity which can be used by your phone for the purpose of charging so it uh, interchanges the information it has changed the information from 220 volt to 1.5 or 3 volt similarly the transfer rna also changes the information it attaches to the messenger rna and it converts that information into the sequence of amino acids so that is the adaptation which is done by the transfer rna it uh, reads the information in the nucleotide sequence and converts it to the sequence of the amino acids it has a very well defined shape can anyone tell me the shape of the transfer rna what is the shape of the transfer rna anyone who can tell me the shape of the transfer rna it is a very well known shape the transfer rna has a well known shape
so the correct answer for this would be clover leaf very good you've got the answer the clover leaf shape the clover leaf shape but very important to remember the clover leaf shape is seen in the two dimensions the clover leaf shape is seen in the two dimensions in the three dimension we have a different shape and that is the inverted l shape remember so for two dimension we will have a different answer for three dimension we will have a different answer so you have to read the question very very carefully before you give the answer because all of us reflexly remember the clover leaf shape if the question says 3d then the answer will be inverted l shape don't make this mistake that for 3d also you're lighting the clover leaf shape for 3d the answer will be the inverted l shape it's something like this inverted l shape for 3d for 2d yes the answer is the clover leaf shape now this transfer rna has multiple arms it has multiple arms so we'll take a look at the arms one by one the first arm the first arm is what is commonly known as the extra r the extra arm is not having any known function the extra arm is also known as the variable arm why is it known as a variable arm because its size is variable its size is variable it can have two different range of size either it is three to five nucleotide long either it is three to five nucleotide long or it is greater than 10 nucleotide long these two categories are used for classification of the tRNA this is the class 1 tRNA and this would be the class 2 tRNA the class 1 and the class 2 tRNA remember the variable arm does not have any known function but we use it for classifying the tRNA into the two different groups Then you come to the first arm, which is known as the T psi C arm. The T psi C arm. This is the arm which attaches tRNA to ribosomal surface. It attaches tRNA to ribosomal surface herein the psi stands for pseudo uridine the t stands for as we previously mentioned thymine is present in the trna although it is normally present only in the dna so this is the thymine the t stands for thymine and the psi stands for pseudo uridine both of them represent modified nucleotide both of them represent modified nucleotide coming from uracil both of them are obtained from uracil what this means is initially the uracil has been incorporated and later it is modified into the pseudouridine and the thymine this means we are talking about the post transcriptional modification so what you are finding in the ribosomal rna there is post transcriptional modification in hnr rna there is post transcriptional modification now in the trna the transfer rna also we find the post transcriptional modification so i'll emphasize again the post transcriptional modification is not the feature of only the hnrna it is seen in all the different type of rna all rna will undergo some degree of post transcriptional modification so the t psi cm attaches the trna to ribosomal surface it has uh, two modified nucleotides the pseudouridine and thymine representing the post transcriptional modification
then we have the acceptor arm the acceptor arm binds the amino acid and this attachment is done by the action of the enzyme called amino acyl tRNA synthetase two things I like to tell here number one this attachment of amino acid by the amino acyl tRNA synthetase requires it requires 2 ATP please remember this we'll use this information later we'll use this information later 2 ATP are consumed when we attach the amino acid uh, uh, by the action of the amino acyl tRNA synthetase that's one second thing all acceptor arm all acceptor arm have the sequence CCA added at the 3 dash end after transcription they have the sequence added at the 3 dash end after transcription again representing the post transcriptional modification all tRNA at the acceptor arm have the sequence 5 dash CCA at the 3 dash end this is a post transcriptional modification and then we have the D arm the D arm is also known as the determining arm it is also known as the determining arm why the determining arm because it selects the correct variant of the enzyme amino acyl tRNA synthetase see all the tRNA at the acceptor arm have the same sequence CCA but the amino acid getting attached on the different RNA is obviously different so how do you determine which amino acid is going to get attached so this is by using a different variants of the enzyme each variant is specific for a particular amino acid so which amino acid is going to get attached depends on the variant that you have selected all right and the selection is done by the d arm that is why we call it the determining arm that is why we call it the determining arm in addition the d stands for dihydrouridine the dihydrouridine is also a modified nucleotide it is a modified nucleotide and again coming from uracil meaning this again represents a post transcriptional modification so d arm is also showing the post transcriptional modification and the last one that we have is the anticodon arm the anticodon arm the anticodon arm attaches to codon on messenger RNA it attaches to codon on the messenger RNA so this is the anticodon arm the anticodon arm attaches to the codon on the messenger RNA one point to note is the anticodon arm sometimes may contain hypoxanthine I'll show you where it is present it is not always present but sometimes it may be present if it is present if it is present it is obviously a modified nucleotide it is obviously a modified nucleotide in this case it comes from adenine in this case it comes from adenine and therefore it, rep it will represent the post transcriptional modification if it is present if it is present it will represent the post transcriptional modification let's take a look
this is the messenger rna 5 dash to 3 dash n to the messenger rna there will be attachment of this is just a representative diagram this is just a representative diagram i am repeating okay here the minus is attached meaning this is the 3 dash end this is the 5 dash end here we will have the c c a the c c a which is there at the 3 dash end please note one thing that the nucleic acid whenever they pair up whenever they pair up they will be anti parallel even when the tRNA is attaching to the messenger RNA, this pairing is anti-parallel. This pairing is anti-parallel. Alright. So what I'll do, I'll uh, highlight the segments. This is the acceptor arm. Obviously, this is the acceptor arm. On one end, we can have the T and the Psi. Then it becomes the T psi C arm, it becomes the T psi C arm. The opposite arm will become the D arm. This is the variable arm, and this is the anti codon arm. Let's highlight or magnify the anti codon arm. Let's magnify the anti codon arm. the three nucleotides and the three nucleotides on the anticodon remember the nucleic acid have to be read from 5 dash to 3 dash end They have to be read from 5 dash to 3 dash end, meaning for the codon, this is nucleotide 1, this is nucleotide 2, and this is the nucleotide 3. For anticodon, this is nucleotide 1, this one is the nucleotide 3, and the nucleotide 2 is obviously the same. The nucleotide 2 is obviously the same. All right. Why I have shown this is to highlight that the pairing between nucleotide 1 and 2 of codon and the corresponding nucleotide on the anticodon. This one is strictly as per Chargaff rule. Strictly as per Chargaff's rule. A will pair with T, G will pair with C. Strictly as per Chargaff rule. But when you talk about the nucleotide 3 of codon and the nucleotide 1 of anticodon, it may or may not it may or may not follow Chargaff rule. About half the time it will follow the Chargaff rule. A will pair with T, G will pair with C. The remaining half time it may not follow the Chargaff rule. In fact, when you are talking about RNA, there will not be T, rather the Ura cell will be there. But uh, the th statement stands, it may or may not follow the Chargaff rule. What this means, a different nucleotide may pair uh, with a nucleotide which is not normally pairing up this uh, flexibility in pairing this flexibility in pairing is unique for the interaction between the nucleotide 3 of uh, uh, codon and uh, nucleotide 1 of the anticodon 
this flexibility is described as wobble phenomena the flexibility in a pairing that i am describing is known as the wobble phenomena and the question is which of the two is the wobble site means which nucleotide position is showing the flexibility which particular nucleotide is able to pair up with two different nucleotides and remember the answer to that question is the nucleotide 1 of the anticodon it is not the nucleotide 3 of codon the wobble site is nucleotide 1 of anticodon meaning let's say we have the nucleotide x at nucleotide 1 position it is able to pair up it is able to pair up with y as well as z it is able to pair up with two different nucleotides at position 3 of the codon that is why we say that the nucleotide 1 of anticodon is the wobble site this is a very important information you have to remember the nucleotide 1 of uh, the anticodon is the wobble site and this is the place where sometimes you may find hypoxanthine you may find hypoxanthine when hypoxanthine is there the pairing increases further it is able to pair up with three different nucleotides okay and when hypoxanthine will be found we've already said it will represent the modified nucleotide meaning it is an instance of post transcriptional modification if hypoxanthine is present at this position it will represent a modified nucleotide and therefore it signifies that a post transcriptional modification has occurred so i'll quickly uh, give us important summary all arms except variable arm undergo post transcriptional modification all arms except the variable arm undergo the post transcriptional modification the modified nucleotides may include the modified nucleotides may include number one pseudo uridine the thymine the dihydrouridine and hypoxanthine and hypoxanthine in addition you have to remember the pseudouridine thymine and dihydrouridine will come from uracil whereas the hypoxanthine will come from the adenine it will come from the adenine okay all arms except the variable arm will undergo post transcriptional modification and the modified nucleotides may include the pseudouridine thymine dihydrouridine and hypoxanthine in case of the transfer rna so that was the uh, transfer rna where are we okay so we have concluded the discussion on transfer rna also what we are left with is the micro rna before i go to micro rna any questions so far anything you want to ask till now quickly let me know before i go to the micro rna
तो नेक्स्ट वी आर स्टार्टिंग विद द माइक्रो आर ने वी आर स्टार्टिंग विद द माइक्रो आर ने फर्स्ट लेट्स लुक टेक अ लुक एट द सिंथेसिस ऑफ माइक्रो आर ने एंड देन विल टॉक अबाउट द फंक्शन ऑफ द माइक्रो आर ने फॉर मोस्ट ऑफ यू इट माइट बी अ न्यू टॉपिक यू माइट नॉट हैव पेड अटेंशन टू माइक्रो आर एन ए वैन वी आर रीडिंग बाइक मिनिस्ट्री इनिशियली फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम सो लेट इस क्विकली टेक अ लुक फर्स्ट एट द सिंथेसिस ऑफ माइक्रो आर ने एंड देन विल टॉक अबाउट द फंक्शन एंड द प्रॉपर्टीज ऑफ द माइक्रो आर ने it is as we discussed transcribed by the rna polymerase 2 in the eukaryotes it is synthesized or transcribed by the rna polymerase 2 giving us the transcript like this okay before i go to micro rna i want me to describe the wobble phenomena i'll quickly describe the wobble phenomena see we said that the codon and anticodon will pair up the codon and anticodon will pair up and we expect this pairing to follow the chargaff rule we have said the nucleotide is pair up as per the chargaff rule the a will combine with u u will combine with a a in rna g will combine with c c will combine with g so this is the expectation that the chargaff rule will be followed but when we examine this pairing in detail we find that position 1 and 2 of the codon they are following the chargaff rule there is no confusion about that they are following the chargaff rule with the corresponding nucleotide on the anticodon that is nucleotide 2 and 3 but when we come to the pairing between the nucleotide 1 of anticodon and the nucleotide 3 of the codon we find that sometimes it follows the chargaff rule sometimes it does not follow the chargaff rule so it is uh, showing some uh, flexibility this flexibility in pairing has been described as wobble phenomena the flexibility in pairing at this position is known as the wobble phenomena the same nucleotide is able to pair up with two different nucleotides one as per the chargaff rule and one against the chargaff rule so where is the flexibility either the nucleotide one will be flexible of the anticodon or the nucleotide three will be flexible in case of codon both cannot be flexible in that case it would have become uh, four combinations right so we find that the wobble site which is responsible for the flexibility is actually the nucleotide 1 of anticodon the nucleotide which is showing the flexibility is the nucleotide 1 of the anticodon all right so this is the wobble phenomena and uh, the wobble site the position nucleotide 1 of anticodon may sometimes contain hypoxanthine if adenine is there it may be modified to hypoxanthine and the benefit of having hypoxanthine is it has more flexibility than the other nucleotides it is able to pair up with three different nucleotides so there is further increase in flexibility or the wobbling that can occur when we include the hypoxanthine the wobble phenomena is very frequently involved in silent mutation we'll see this when we are doing the mutations later it is very frequently involved in silent mutation okay we'll see this later when we are doing the mutations i hope uh, that solves your query uh camera pu okay i hope that solves your query and we are coming back to the micro rna okay so the rna polymerase 2 will synthesize the primary transcript as soon as the primary transcript is synthesized 
it gets the cap and the tail please note the attachment of cap and the tail is commonly seen in products of RNA polymerase 2 because the enzymes which carry out the capping and tailing travel with polymerase 2 so as soon as the transcript is formed you will find the cap and the tail are attached whether they are required or not doesn't matter they are quickly attached this structure which has been synthesized is known as primary micro RNA in short it is the pri my RNA it is the primary micro RNA in short it is the pri my RNA the pri my RNA is acted upon by two enzymes it is acted upon by two enzymes drosha and the dgcr8 it is acted upon by two enzymes the drosha and dgcr8 please note the dgcr8 is also lovingly known as pasha we have this character in a lot of Hindi serials, Pasha. So you can remember the name from there. The Drosha and the Pasha. Drosha and the Pasha. What do they do? The cap and the tail are actually not required. So they are cleaved by the action of Drosha and Pasha. Result we get a structure like this. We get a structure like this. You'll notice that broadly speaking, the two structures are quite similar. The broadly speaking, the two structures are quite similar. The structure is described as the stem loop structure. This is the loop this is the loop and these knobby protrusions give the appearance of a stem from where branches come out if you take off the branches that knob will still be there so that is why we call it the stem and the loop because it is folded upon itself so the term loop is used so both the primary micro RNA and what is known as the pre micro RNA the primary microRNA and the pre microRNA both have the stem loop structure. This change that we see has till now been occurring inside the nucleus. So you can think of it as the post transcriptional modification. After transcription, the modification that occurs within the nucleus is the post transcriptional modification. At this point, the pre microRNA is pushed out from the nucleus by the nuclear pore it is pushed out from the nucleus by the nuclear pore in this case the transporter protein is x protein 5 the x protein 5 will push the pre micro rna from the nucleus into the cytoplasm so our pre micro RNA has now come to the cytoplasm okay this is the pre micro RNA the pre micro RNA is now acted upon by another enzyme and this enzyme is dicer what the dicer does it cleaves the loop the dicer will cleave the loop so that now you get the structure like this the loop is gone the loop part is gone As you can see, it doesn't look like a double-stranded RNA. 
so we cannot call it the double stranded rna what we call it instead is a duplex rna why the duplex it is just like a duplex flat where uh, we have two stories ground floor first floor but the two floors do not have the similar structure so some parts are similar some parts are different that is why the term duplex is called the term duplex is used at this point the two strands are separated the two strands are separated and one of these strands one of the strands is loaded one of the strands is loaded into a protein complex known by the name risk the microRNA which the RNA which has been loaded is very small 18 to 25 nucleotide long and that is why it is called the micro RNA it is very very small 18 to 25 nucleotide long and therefore it is called the micro RNA the term risk stands for RNA induced silencing complex the risk stands for RNA induced silencing complex so we'll see the function of risk activated risk don't worry i'll quickly go through the synthesis again and then summarize the information we're talking about the synthesis of the micro rna the micro rna is initially transcribed from the dna by the action of the rna polymerase 2 this we had listed previously the micro rna synthesized by the rna polymerase 2 the initial transcript is called the primary micro rna as soon as the primary micro RNA is formed, it receives the cap and the tail. Although they are not required, they are always added to the products of RNA polymerase 2. This complex, the primary micro RNA, is acted upon by two enzymes, the drosha and the DGCR8. DGCR8 is also known as Pasha. These two enzymes will remove the cap and the tail so that we get the pre micro RNA, which doesn't have the cap and the tail. The primary microRNA and pre microRNA both have the structure which is described as the stem loop structure. Both of them have the structure which is described as the stem loop structure. The pre microRNA is at this point pushed out from the nucleus into the cytoplasm via the nuclear pore by the action of the protein, the X protein 5. In the cytoplasm, the pre microRNA is acted upon by another enzyme, the dicer, which removes the loop, resulting in formation of the microRNA duplex. The two strands of microRNA duplex will separate and one of them is introduced into the risk complex that is the rna induced silencing complex which then becomes the activated risk once it gets the micro rna it get it becomes the activated risk now let us look at the functions of the micro rna now we are talking about the function of micro rna the primary function of micro rna is regulation of gene expression the primary function of micro rna is regulation of gene expression this regulation is so efficient this regulation is so efficient approximately 100 genes can be regulated by one single micro RNA up to 100 genes can be regulated by one single micro RNA how does this regulation work the regulation works by what is known as RNA interference the regulation works by what is known as RNA interference simply written as RNAi the Nobel Prize for the discovery of RNA interference was given in 2006 in the year 2006 the Nobel Prize for discovery of RNA interference was given when I say RNA interference what exactly do I mean the RNA interference implies 
it is going to prevent the translation prevent means it will interfere with the translation by what are the various ways it can cause degradation of messenger RNA it can cause degradation of messenger RNA it can cause destabilization of the messenger RNA finally it directly prevents or hinders translation of the messenger RNA here the correct form term should be decreases okay it decreases the translation by degradation of messenger RNA destabilization of messenger RNA or preventing or hindering the translation of messenger RNA please note all of this is occurring within the cytoplasm the messenger RNA is present in the cytoplasm the micro RNA uh, complex the risk complex is present in the cytoplasm so they are able to act only in the cytoplasm they are able to act only in the cytoplasm all this preventing of translation is known as knock down phenomena it is known as knock down phenomena fewer protein copies are translated from messenger RNA before degradation fewer protein copies are translated from the messenger RNA before degradation so I'll quickly repeat the function of microRNA is it regulates the gene expression regulation is very efficient approximately up to 100 genes can be regulated by one single microRNA the way by which the regulation occurs is known as RNA interference in other words it is called the RNA I the Nobel Prize for which was given in 2006 the RNA interference acts by degradation of messenger RNA, the destabilization of messenger RNA and prevention of translation of messenger RNA all of it occurring in the cytoplasm the result is what is known as the knock down phenomena meaning fewer protein copies are translated from messenger RNA before the RNA gets degraded so this is about the micro RNA that you need to know about this is the micro RNA you will also come across two similar sounding terms knock in and knock out these two terms are used at the level of DNA these two terms are used at the level of DNA knock in you add a gene segment in DNA knockout you remove a gene segment from DNA similar sounding term to knock down so please don't get confused the knock down is occurring at the level of messenger RNA in the cytoplasm the knock in and knock out is occurring at the level of DNA in knock in you are adding a gene segment in the DNA and knock out you are removing a gene segment from the DNA so these are occurring at the level of DNA no point in getting confused okay so now we have talked about the different type of the RNA the coding and non coding RNA now quickly we will talk about the relationship between DNA and RNA when the translation occurs what is the relationship between the DNA and RNA 
I call it the DNA RNA sequence relationship the DNA RNA sequence relationship okay look very carefully now that I'm describing the DNA RNA sequence relationship you have to look at it very 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 carefully we have the two strands of DNA one of them running from 5 dash to 3 dash end in that case the second or the complementary strand will run in the opposite direction that is 3 dash to 5 dash end all right now when the DNA is uh, getting transcribed into the RNA remember any of the two strands can be used for transcription when the transcription occurs from the DNA any of the two strands can be used for transcription it will depend on the gene that we are going to transcribe the position of the genes will vary depending on which gene we are talking about some of them will be present on the upper strand some of them will be present on the lower strand for the purpose of simplicity for our discussion let's assume that the translation is occurring from the lower strand and this is the RNA transcript that we are getting to form please note the translation the translation the RNA synthesis when it occurs will follow two rules the synthesis always occurs from 5 dash to 3 dash direction the relationship between two nucleic acid whenever they pair will always be anti parallel the 3 dash end will align with the 5 dash end the 5 dash end will align with the 3 dash end so anti parallel and synthesis always occurs from 5 dash to 3 dash end i am repeating this again and again so that you don't forget it always the synthesis will occur from 5 dash to 3 dash end the two nucleic acid whenever they pair up are anti parallel okay so this is the dna this is the RNA the strand from which we copy the RNA the strand from which we copy the RNA this is known as the template strand this is called the template strand obviously the second strand will be known as the non-template strand the second strand is obviously known as the non-template strand now if we look at the template strand and we compare it with the RNA we find the two strands are anti-parallel and they are complementary obviously we have synthesized the new nucleic acid by complementary pairing in place of in front of g we put the c in front of t we put the a in front of a we put the u in front of c we put the g so by complementary base pairing we have formed so the two strands are anti-parallel and the two strands are complementary a similar relationship exists between this template strand and the non-template strand the two strands are also anti-parallel and complementary to each other what this means when you compare the template strand with the RNA transcript when you compare the non template strand with the RNA transcript what you find the sequence of the two are quite similar only difference will be in place of thymine you will find uracil on the RNA because they have similar codons the non template strand is also known as the coding strand they have the similar sense or meaning so it is also known as the sense strand it is also known as the sense strand the template strand is therefore known as the non coding or the anti sense strand it is known as the non coding or the anti sense strand these terms are very very important because in the question 
when the question will come on the dna rna sequence relationship at that point the diagram may not be there most probably the diagram will not be there but the orientation will be described by the terms that i am using here the non template strand the coding strand the sense strand the template strand the non coding strand the anti sense strand these will be the terms which will be there all right so the terms are very very important once we have seen the structure let's look at what type of questions will come in the exam let's generate a random sequence starting from 5 dash and let's say we have the sequence a t g t c g a c g something like that a random sequence we have now according to the description please note we have two strands if this is the sequence of dna it may belong to the template strand or it may belong to the non template or the coding strand so we'll describe the situation for both the scenarios suppose this sequence belongs to the coding strand suppose this sequence belongs to the coding strand if this sequence belongs to the coding strand in that case you have to perform only one function to get the sequence of the rna you have to perform only one function and that is replace thymine by uracil please note the coding strand and the rna they have the same orientation 5 dash 5 dash the nucleotides are also same only thing is on dna you will have the thymine and on rna you will have the uracil so if we talking about the coding strand the answer in this case should be very simple 5 dash a u g u c g a c g 3 dash given the sequence of the coding strand now you are able to quickly write down the answer for the rna transcript so if we have the coding strand the answer is very very simple and straight forward the problem occurs when the question describes that okay this is the template strand that is when all the problem starts when we say template strand multiple problems are there multiple problems are there number 1 when you are reading the sequence of rna and you write the sequence from 5 dash end you are actually reading the sequence of dna from the 3 dash end if you are writing the sequence of rna from 3 dash end you are reading the sequence of dna from 5 dash end the first point is the positions are at opposite end the positions are at opposite end second point is the sequences have to be complementary they are not the same sequences and the last point is the same replace thymine by uracil so i'll write the rules that we have to follow you have to write nucleotides not write you have to read the nucleotides from opposite end if you want to write the sequence of rna from 5 dash to 3 dash end you have to read the dna from 3 dash to 5 dash end if you want to write the sequence from 3 dash to 5 dash end you have to read the dna from 5 dash to 3 dash end so you have to read nucleotide from opposite end once you started reading from opposite end then you write complementary bases then you write complementary bases and the third rule is same the third rule is same what is that replace thymine by uracil replace thymine by uracil let's try to put this into practice we have to write the sequence of rna from 5 dash end so we start reading it from 3 dash end 
we start reading it from three dash n. That is step one. Step two, you have to write complementary bases. So in place of G, we are going to write C. In place of C, we are going to write G. In place of A, we are going to write T. In place of G, we are going to write C. In place of C, we will write G. In place of T, we will write A. In place of G, we will write C. In place of T, we will write A. And in place of A, we will write T. That's step 2. And step 3 says, replace thymine by uracil. So the answer becomes C, G, U. C, G, A. C A U 3 dash it. This is the final RNA transcript. I'll repeat how we have come to this answer. Step 1 read the nucleotide or the bases from the opposite end. So, if you are writing it from the 5 dash end for the RNA, we have to read the DNA from the 3 dash end. We have to read the DNA from 3 dash end. That's why we are reading from opposite end. Step 2 write complementary bases in place of g we are writing c in place of c we are writing g in place of a we are writing t in place of g we are writing c c g t a g c t a and a replaced by t that was step two and finally step three replace thymine by uracil replace thymine by uracil and then we come to the answer so the dna sequence you note in the two questions was the same first question we said this is the sequence for the coding strand what is the RNA transcript we got the RNA transcript here second question we said this is the sequence for the template strand what is the sequence of RNA we got the sequence for RNA here and if you compare the two sequences you'll find that they are miles apart for the same sequence of DNA Based on the description, whether it is a template strand or it is a coding strand, the corresponding sequence of RNA will be the different sequence. This is what we describe as a DNA-RNA sequence relationship. This is what we describe as the DNA-RNA sequence relationship. Sometimes the examiner can try to trap you in this question. For example, they will give you the information we have a DNA RNA hybrid DNA RNA hybrid sequence of DNA is given can you find out the RNA sequence is this information enough? I'll repeat the question. And a molecule has been given which is a DNA RNA hybrid. One of the strands is DNA, one of the strands is RNA. We are providing you the sequence of DNA. What is the sequence from 5 dash to 3 dash end? Can you tell us the sequence of RNA in a particular direction, maybe from 5 dash to 3 dash end? Is the information given enough for determining the sequence of RNA or not? Anyone can tell me is the is the information enough to determine the sequence of RNA? Let's go back to the diagram and look at this structure. What do you see here? The DNA is attached to the RNA. The DNA is attached to the RNA. The DNA is attached to the RNA. DNA is attached to the RNA. DNA is attached to RNA. 
so when i say dna rna hybrid i have already told you that we are talking about the template strand i don't need to mention again that it is the template strand as soon as i tell you that it is the dna rna hybrid you have to remember whenever two nucleic acid will pair up they will be anti parallel the new sequence will be complementary and it denotes the pairing of rna with the template strand so additional information is not required the dna rna hybrid question has to be solved exactly as you will do for the template strand meaning you have to follow the three steps read from opposite end write complementary bases and replace thymine by uracil exactly as you'll do for the template strand so this is the only place where the examiner can trap you remember the dna rna hybrid means we are talking about the template strand where the rna is attached during the transcription obviously during transcription the rna will be attached to the dna and it will appear as the dna rna hybrid so dna rna hybrid implies we are talking about the template strand so don't get trapped in this question whenever it says dna rna hybrid we are actually talking about the template strand and you have to follow the rules as we have described for the template strand any question so far any question so far the next thing that we are going to talk about is the genetic code so till now what we have done we first talked about the nucleotides we looked at the composition of the nucleotides we talked about the properties of the nucleotides then we talked about the nucleic acids we looked at the properties of the dna and the rna we talked about the properties of the dna and the rna and now we are talking about the genetic code the genetic code basically is the relationship between the nucleotide sequence and the amino acid which will replace this nucleotide sequence so that is the genetic code now obviously there are large number of codons and you don't need to memorize all the translations but when we are uh, observing the translation from the nucleotide sequence to the amino acid sequence we observe that certain uh, properties are appearing certain uh, uh, pattern is being followed and we describe it as the properties of the genetic code so what are the properties of the genetic code we'll quickly enumerate first and foremost the genetic code is a triplet code the genetic code is a triplet code in addition to being a triplet code it is degenerate or it shows degeneracy the genetic code displays degeneracy although it shows a degeneracy the genetic code is unambiguous i'll describe each of the terms don't worry although it is showing degeneracy the genetic code is unambiguous the genetic code is commaless the another term used is non punctuated and the genetic code is non overlapping lastly the genetic code in all living organisms on this planet earth is similar and we describe it as a genetic code being universal on this planet earth we describe it as being universal on this planet earth we'll talk about them one by one when i say triplet code this means we are talking about the codon as the basic unit of the genetic code the codon will be made up of three nucleotides 
the code on will be made of three nucleotides. Right? This is what we mean by the triplet code. In addition, you have to remember each of the positions in the codon can be occupied by four different nucleotides. When you are talking about RNA, it can be A, U, G, C. Since the position of nucleotide is unique, first position, second position and third position, the possible number of combinations, unique combinations will be a product of the numbers and that is 64 unique combinations, we describe them as 64 codons. So genetic code is a triplet code. Each position occupied by four nucleotides. Therefore, we have 64 unique codons. What this means, if the examiner changes the values, if the examiner can change the values, how? He can tell you that, okay, it is not a triplet code. It is a quadruplet code. It is a quadruplet code. How many possible unique codons are there? When I say it is a quadruplet code, obviously you will have to increase one position here and put in the same value 4. In that case, the answer becomes 256 unique codons. When I say it is the quadruplet code, immediately it becomes 256 unique codons. The second way in which I can vary the information is each position can be occupied by five different nucleotides. Let's say the hypoxanthine is also seen in any of the three positions. In that case, the value within the box becomes five and the possible number of unique codons becomes 125. So this is the importance of understanding from where this number 64 comes. From where this number 64 comes is a very important concept which you have to remember. Alright. So remember this point, the genetic code in our body in the universe is a triplet code resulting in 64 unique codons. Now the 64 unique codons, out of these, the three are stop codons. The three are stop codons. So we are left with the 61 codons. Now very interestingly, the 61 codons are responsible for coding for only 20 amino acids. On an average, we have 3 codons per amino acid. On an average, we have 3 codons per amino acid. What this means is codon 1, codon 2, codon 3, all of them code for the same amino acid. Similarly, codon 4, codon 5 code for the same amino acid, amino acid 2. So multiple codons exist for the same amino acid. Multiple codons exist for the same amino acid. This is what we call as degeneracy. We have a backup, fallback, safety mechanism. Multiple codons exist for the same amino acid. This is known as degeneracy. However, the degeneracy is there. Correct. True. However, it doesn't happen that once you do the translation, the C3 is getting converted to amino acid 1. And the second time you do the translation, the genetic code, the codon is getting converted to amino acid 2. This does not happen. So although the genetic code is degenerate, multiple codons for the same amino acid, the translation of a particular codon is fixed. One codon will always get translated to the same amino acid. The translation doesn't change. That is why the genetic code is unambiguous. The translation never changes. The translation never changes. Let's say you have a sequence like this.
all right and you start making the codons in triplet forms this is codon 1 now when the time comes to read the codon number 2 you say oh I don't like the C so I'll start my codon 2 from here this is not allowed like we said the genetic code is commonless or non punctuated doesn't matter from where the nucleotide has come doesn't matter whether you like it or not if it is there it has to be included when you are reading the frame it doesn't matter from where it has come if it is there it has to be read and this is how you will get the codon 2 alternately sometimes what can happen you may decide okay G is a very good nucleotide let's start our second codon from here again this is not allowed once a nucleotide has been used for a codon it cannot be used for any other codon the genetic code is non overlapping a nucleotide can be used for only a single codon we cannot use it for multiple codons this is the non overlapping nature and lastly the genetic code is universal meaning in all the life forms on the planet earth will find the same translation for a particular genetic code this implies this is an indication all life form has evolved from a common precursor cell the genetic code may be different in the alien life forms if they have developed from a different precursor cell obviously but the fact that the genetic code is universal on all life forms on the planet earth implies that all life form has evolved from a common precursor cell and that is why we have the same genetic code or the translation in all the life forms in the planet the only exception that we see is in the mitochondria which we have already described and uh, we had said the mitochondria represents a very very early endosymbiotic prokaryote so uh, some differences there in the very early uh, developmental phase but later on all of them will have the similar uh, translation so this is the six properties of the genetic code they should be on your tips very frequently asked and it is very easy for the examiner to trip you for example He'll write four options and he'll ask you which of the following is not a property of the genetic code and it is very easy to trip you they will just remove the n un and you will read it and you'll think oh i have heard this term ambiguous sir had said something like this when we're talking about the genetic code similarly we can remove the non part here we can remove the non part here and that is the source of confusion remember remember the six properties of the genetic code the genetic code is a triplet code it shows degeneracy it is unambiguous it is commonless or non-punctuated it is non-overlapping and it is universal these are the six properties of the genetic code okay sometimes there can be change in the sequence of nucleotides this change in the sequence of nucleotides is described as what we commonly call what we commonly call as mutation so the next thing that we are quickly going to talk about before we finish today is mutation so let us talk about mutation basically when I say mutation this means we are talking about two copies we are talking about two copies of a gene with variable nucleotide sequence This is what I said when you change one of the nucleotides one or more nucleotides in a given gene that is what we known as 
mutation so we have two copies of a gene both of them have a variable nucleotide sequence in the same frame we have another term and that is a polymorphism so you should be able to distinguish between the two what do you mean by mutation what do you mean by polymorphism because polymorphism also has the same definition two copies of a gene with variable nucleotide sequence so how do you distinguish between the mutation and the polymorphism they have the similar composition of the uh, nucleotide sequence uh, similar differences are there how do you distinguish please note the difference is statistical mutation is present in less than 1% of population polymorphism is a change which is present in one or more percent of population so remember the difference is purely statistical structurally they will appear the same you cannot say just by looking at the composition where you are talking about the mutation or the polymorphism unless you know the distribution of the various uh, variants in the population without that we cannot tell whether we are looking at the mutation or we are looking at the polymorphism now two very common well known mutations that you have to know about the first being the base substitution also known as the point mutation what is the corresponding polymorphism for base substitution or point mutation please note first we will get the mutation gradually when the mutation will spread in the population when it crosses the threshold of 1% then it becomes a polymorphism so all mutation will gradually evolve into the polymorphism polymorphism doesn't arise de novo it has to come from the mutation only so this is the mutation the base substitution or point mutation in what polymorphism does it evolve it evolves into what is known as the single nucleotide polymorphism because the base substitution of point mutation is the most common mutation the snp is the most common polymorphism the snp is the most common polymorphism so when we talk about base substitution or point mutation we can have two types of base substitution point mutation i'll show them one by one let's say you have the purines here and the pyrimidines here we'll make another pile of purines and pyrimidines the purines in the uh, rna will be adenine and guanine the purines will be the cytosine and uracil the cytosine and the uracil now if a purine is replaced by another purine a pyrimidine is replaced by another pyrimidine such a change will simply be known as transition such a change will simply be known as transition however if a purine is replaced by a pyrimidine a pyrimidine is replaced by purine a purine is replaced by pyrimidine a pyrimidine is replaced by purine a purine is replaced by pyrimidine a pyrimidine replaced by purine purine replaced by pyrimidine pyrimidine replaced by purine such a change is known as transversion so the base substitution or the point mutation will present themselves as either transition or transversion they will present themselves either as transition or transversion what is the effect of transition or transversion let's see what is the effect of transition or transversion we'll do this using an example we'll use some similar codons that we already have encountered for example we have previously talked about the aga we had said that aga normally 
codes for arginine all right aga normally codes for arginine so what we are going to do we are going to cause a mutation we have caused a mutation at position 3 and we have placed a by g so now the sequence becomes a g g and if you recall from the mitochondria we had said the a g g also codes for arginine it also codes for arginine all right so what has happened there is a change in the sequence of nucleotide but the protein which has the amino acid doesn't get to know about this change because it is still getting the same amino acid and because it doesn't get to know about the change it is not going to make any noise we call it the silent mutation what is the cause of silent mutation there are two aspects here number one remember we have what is known as degeneracy different codons coding for the same amino acid the degeneracy is possible because of the wobble phenomena all right the same trna will be able to bind to the two different nucleotides and the trna is carrying the amino acid so the same amino acid can be attached to two different codons it can be attached to the codon aga it can be attached to the codon agg that's why i told you the wobble phenomena is associated with what is known as the silent mutation okay so first we get the silent mutation let's carry out the same change but at a different position now the sequence that we get is ggA now ggA does not code for arginine rather it codes for glycine now what has happened the change in nucleotide sequence has resulted in a change in the amino acid the meaning of the codon has changed the translation the sense of the codon has changed and it is not correct therefore we call it the miss sense mutation the sense of the codon is wrong we call it the miss sense mutation and sometimes a single change can be catastrophic if you replace the a by u and now the sequence becomes UGA you know that UGA is actually the stop codon the stop codon cannot get translated it doesn't make any sense and therefore it is known as the nonsense mutation when a single nucleotide change results in the appearance of stop codon we call it the nonsense mutation so the transition and transversion that we talked about can result in the silent mutation the missing mutation or the nonsense mutation what do you see in these changes in silent mutation you get the same protein there is no change in the protein that you are getting you get the same protein in the miss sense mutation what happens you're getting the same protein means the size of the protein is same but one single amino acid has been changed we get the same protein size but one amino acid has been changed whereas in the nonsense mutation we get the smaller protein the technical term is truncated the translation will stop wherever the stop codon has been formed so the complete translation does not occur we don't get the complete protein wherever the translation stops only that much protein is formed so we get the truncated or the smaller protein the silent mutation will have the same protein the non mutation will have the truncated or the smaller protein whereas in missing mutation we get the protein of the same size however a single amino acid has been changed a single amino acid has been changed we get the protein of the same size but a single amino acid has been changed what is the implication 
of this change in the amino acid what is the effect on the protein if you change a single amino acid what is the effect on the protein again the effect is not fixed we can have variable effects we can have variable effects it depends where the change in the protein is occurring sometimes the change will be not causing any major alteration in the properties of the protein we call it the acceptable we call it the acceptable miss sense mutation what is happening in acceptable miss sense mutation there is no change in physical chemical or biological properties there is no change in physical chemical or biological properties that will be a uh, acceptable miss sense mutation alternately we can have a partially acceptable we can have a partially acceptable miss sense mutation what is happening here there is change but only in physical and chemical but not in biological properties remember we had said the function of the protein is its most primary uh, property and if the function is not getting changed even if there is slight change in the physical chemical properties it would be still acceptable because the protein is still able to perform its function and last we have what is known as unacceptable miss sense mutation reason being here there is loss of biological activity here there is loss of biological activity so if the biological activity is lost the primary property of the protein is disrupted and it is unacceptable i'll give you some examples here the example for ex, uh, unacceptable miss mutation is hpm it is the inherited met hemoglobin also known as hemoglobin boston also known as the hemoglobin boston it is a inherited meth hemoglobin where uh, histidine is replaced by uh, another amino acid and therefore it cannot maintain the iron in the reduced state the histidine has been replaced by maybe tyrosine or the tryptophan and it is unable to maintain the iron in the reduced state example of partially acceptable misinterpretation the hbs c d e o all of these variants of hemoglobin are partially acceptable miss mutation why the ability to transport the oxygen is unaffected however there is some change in one or other physical or chemical properties for example in hps there is tendency towards cycling in the deoxygenated state but the ability to transport the oxygen is still the same so no change in biological activity but alteration of physical uh, or chemical properties now coming to the acceptable misinterpretation some examples can be hemoglobin adelaide hemoglobin milwaukee hemoglobin hikari these are some examples from a list of more than 300 different hemoglobins which have a minor a single amino acid change but overall the physical chemical biological properties are exactly the same only way to distinguish them is either to deconstruct the composition or a very detailed electrophoresis where a very 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 minor difference can get amplified and even then it is very difficult to separate only by sequencing the amino acid uh, of the protein we can identify the differences in the uh, more than 300 different variants of hemoglobin which perform the function exactly similarly they have the similar physical and the chemical properties one very important point to note the most common 
partially acceptable misrepresentation or rather you can say the most common the most common abnormal hemoglobin variant is HPS and therefore you must know the details about HPS what is different in HPS how is it different from the normal hemoglobin this you must know so the points to remember about HPS is The hemoglobin is made up of multiple chains 2 alpha and 2 beta so the change is occurring in the beta chain each chain has eight helices numbering from a onwards so in a helix in beta chain in a helix and each helix will have the sequence of amino acids reading from one so at position 6 at position 6 what is the change the glutamic acid is replaced by valine the glutamic acid is replaced by valine so in beta chain in a helix at position 6 the glutamic acid is replaced by valine this is the change that we get to see in HBS how to remember G is gone in HBS the G is gone the glutamic acid has been replaced and the valine will come why I'm telling you this because when you reach the exam you'll remember the glutamic acid and valine but you'll get confused which was there originally which is there in the HPS so remember in HPS the G is gone when the glutamic acid is there normally the charge is responsible for repulsion but when you bring in the valine there is no repulsion and therefore there is what is known as stickiness which results in sickling okay the valine doesn't have any charge so when two hemoglobin come together the place where there was some repulsion between the hemoglobin is not there and <coughs> because of that the deoxygenated hemoglobin will tend to stick together this is <coughs> known as the sickling so this is about the most common type of mutation that you will come across which I had told you and that is the base substitution or the point mutation. The base substitution or the point mutation is the most common type of mutation. It can be transition or transversion. The transition and transversion result in the silent the missense or the non mutation in silent mutation you get the same protein in mutation you get the same protein size but one amino acid changed and in non mutation you get a truncated or the smaller protein talking about the mutation, the mutation may be acceptable it may be partially acceptable or it may be unacceptable in acceptable misrepresentation there is no change in physical chemical or biological properties in partially acceptable misrepresentation there is change in physical and chemical but not in the biological property whereas in unacceptable mutation the biological activity is lost the examples include hbm or hemoglobin boston for the unacceptable misrepresentation the variants of hemoglobin hbs c d e o for partially acceptable examples like H hemoglobin adelaide milwaukee and Hikari for acceptable misrepresentation. HPS is the most common abnormal hemoglobin variant wherein you find that in beta chain in A helix at position 6 the glutamic acid has been replaced by valine normally in the hemoglobin the glutamic acid because of its charge causes repulsion between the different hemoglobin they cannot stick together but when you replace the glutamic acid by valine there is no repulsion results in stickiness and ultimately when the hemoglobin come together they stick causing what is known as sickling we move on to the second most common variant of mutation 
and this is the insertion deletion the second most common variant and it is the insertion deletion now uh, in insertion deletion what you get to see is primarily frame shift mutation primarily we get to see the frame shift mutation i'll show it here let's say we have the sequence 5 dash a u g c g a c c a g g c something like this we read the codons codon 1 codon 2 codon 3 codon 4 like this now imagine imagine that a nucleotide has been inserted here let's say a has been inserted here recall that doesn't matter from where the nucleotide has come if it is there it has to be included in the codon so what will happen this will be codon 1 but codon 2 will change when codon 2 changes codon 3 will change when codon 3 changes codon 4 will change and what you find the reading frame of the codons has shifted this is known as the frame shift mutation insertion you can see results in frame shift mutation something similar will occur if there is a deletion let's say that g has been deleted now when you read the codons again some different sequence will be there because the triplet code is there you need three nucleotides so now the codon 2 has changed when codon 2 changes codon 3 will change and therefore subsequently the codon 4 will also change this also is a shift in the reading frame so whether there is insertion or there is deletion we observe what is called the frame shift mutation alright there are two changes in this observation there are two possible variations in the frame shift mutation we can have a pair of insertion deletion we can have a pair of insertion deletion what this means here what this means here imagine first we have an insertion here we have an insertion and after that we have a deletion so this is a pair of insertion deletion so what will happen the codon 2 has changed this is codon 2 codon 3 has changed but as soon as you encounter the complementary change initially there was insertion and then you encounter the deletion or initially there was deletion and then you encounter the insertion as soon as you encounter the complementary change the reading frame is restored what was previously codon 4 is now again the codon 4 so how do you describe it when there is a pair of insertion deletion there is a temporary frame shift mutation so frame temporary frame shift mutation is seen when there is a pair of insertion deletion and lastly we have the insertion deletion in multiples of 3 this number 3 is important because the genetic code is a triplet code that is why this number 3 is important see what will happen here we carry out insertion in multiples of 3 and then we read the codon codon 2 is a a a what was previously codon 2 now becomes codon 3 
what is previously code on 3 now becomes code on 4 what is previously code on 4 now becomes code on 5 this is when we have insertion in multiple of 3 what happens when we have deletion in multiples of 3 what was previously code on 3 now becomes code on 2 what was previously code on 4 now becomes code on 3 so here the number of codons has decreased each codon gets translated to an amino acid so therefore the number of amino acids will decrease so when there is insertion deletion in multiples of 3 there is either gain or loss of amino acid this is the most frequently asked type of question from the insertion deletion they'll give you certain numbers in the option a b c d they'll give you numbers 2 3 4 5 and they'll ask on insertion of how many nucleotides the frame shift will not occur so there you have to remember you have to identify the multiples of 3 in case of multiples of 3 the frame shift will not occur what will occur is the gain or the loss of amino acid the frame shift will not occur what will occur will be the gain or loss of the amino acid so this is about the mutation that is occurring the mutation that is occurring besides this there can be large number of different uh, mutations there are large number of different mutations you can have uh, inversion uh, you can have translocation uh, so all of these changes can be there but they are quite rare and you need not go into the details of them what you need to remember is the base substitution of point mutation which is the most common followed by the insertion deletion type mutation which commonly causes the frame shift mutation all right any questions so far any questions so far because uh, today we are going to stop here only tomorrow we will start with the metabolism of the purines and pyrimidines we will first talk about the purines and then move on to pyrimidine we will talk about both synthesis and degradation along with the associated disorders and uh, a little bit about the hyperuricemia from which the questions are coming so if you have any questions please let me know if there are no questions we'll uh, stop here and uh, begin tomorrow the morning uh, the information will be given to you in the morning at what time we'll have tomorrow probably the same time uh, 7 or 8 well, seven, 8 o'clock because till 7 30 a lot of students are going for the iftar party so probably same time 7 30 or 8 any questions from what we have discussed till now i presume there was one question in the beginning of the session which i had said i'll take in the end let me see yeah one question was there talking about uh, retinitis pigmentosa very good okay please note that uh, the retinitis pigmentosa is a presentation all right it is not describing uh, the pathophysiology or the genetic underlying genetic disorder so yes the retinitis pigmentosa uh, generally comes under autosomal uh, disorder but uh, the NARP that I had told you in that the retinitis pigmentosa is one feature all right besides that we had the other features so uh, the retinitis pigmentosa can be a part of other spectrum of disorders also the retinitis pigmentosa correctly you said that it is a autosomal dis uh, disorder but uh, the uh, retinitis pigmentosa is a part of other complex disorders in our case it was a part of the mitochondrial disorder also any questions before we close the session for today any questions any questions 